morning. It is good to see you today. So grateful that you're here. Uh, I'm excited about today's message, partly because I'm carved up. How many of y'all been to a state fair? Come on, somebody in this house. I, I got me a good foot long corn dog yesterday and a, uh, what was that thing we got? Funnel cake. Thank you, Lord, for funnel cake. Lord, we just received the blessing from your hand. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here. I've never seen that many people in my life at one place. And so I'd encourage you, if you haven't gone, keep your salvation and don't, because uh, it'll help you a lot. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm grateful to be with you as we continue our series, Building Boundaries. Grateful that you're here. Uh, and today we're going to have some fun because we're going to dig deeper into some of the things that I spoke about last week. I would encourage you, if you didn't get a chance to hear last week's message, uh, go back and listen to it. Because over these weeks, we're going to kind of build on one message after the other. And that's why we're going to spend some time doing uh, today. If you have your Bible, I'd love for you to go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. We're going to get there in just a few minutes. I uh, also want to encourage you that all of my notes are on the app, and there's a lot of notes today. Uh, and so I'd encourage you either get something out that you can take notes with, uh, or you can get on our app and you can follow along there as we go through today's message. The title of today's message is Close Encounters. Look at your neighbor say, Close Encounters. Uh, now, now, last week I, I ended talking about three types of people. And here's the reality is it doesn't matter uh, how you live, you're going to have to deal with all three of these types of people. So we're going to have some close encounters. And how we navigate those close encounters really do matter in our life. And so that's kind of what I'm going to give you some nuts and bolts today. The first part of this uh, message is going to be very teacher driven as we kind of continue on in this thought. And then we're going to land in a place that I really believe the Holy Spirit's going to do some deep work in all of our lives. Uh, the diagnostic question for this series, and it's a question that I think is powerful for us to ask ourselves, but also ask those that we're in relationship with and, and really process this question. But it's this, what does a person do when the truth comes to them? Uh, what does a person do when the truth comes to them? Uh, we live in a culture that for some reason is allergic to truth. Partly because we believe, a, a vast majority of people believe today, that truth is whatever they believe that it is. But can I just assure you today that there's a truth that it doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not, it's still true. And partly that's why we're all in this house, is because we believe that we're not our own gods. When truth becomes what I believe that it is, then there is no need to worship anyone greater than me because I've taken the seat on my own heart. And so coming to this place that we really begin to assess what happens or what does a person do when the truth comes to them? This was the passage of scripture we used to set up this series, John chapter 2, 23 through 25. I love this thought about Jesus because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him. But Jesus didn't trust them. How many of y'all that just get you free already? All right, praise the Lord. Because they knew all about people. No one needed to tell him about human nature for he knew what was in each, one, each person's heart. Last week as we began to talk about relationships and how do we navigate relationships and building good boundaries. We begin to talk about that we'll view people one of three ways. We'll either look naively at them. There's a lot of people out there that just think everybody's good. How many of you know and live life long enough that knows that not everybody's good? All right, some of y'all have been stabbed in the back. You're like, I know that, oh Lord. Second way that we view people is paranoid. We're gonna view them through a paranoid lens. There's a lot of people today that have been burnt so much that they live life paranoid that they're gonna get hurt again. Uh, let me, can I be, I'm gonna put on my pastor hat real quick. Some of y'all didn't know it was off. I got my teacher hat on this morning. I'm gonna put on my pastor hat, you ready? Guess what, if you live life, you're gonna get hurt. But is it really worth living life jaded? You're gonna to have to make a decision that for you to live life to the fullest, you're gonna actually have to open up your heart again because there's potential that it'll get hurt. That's some good preaching already this morning. I can tell that went over really well. <laughs> Becoming this place that we're not going to live life paranoid. The third option is that we're going to live life discerning. Seeing in the spirit, 
recognizing what's going on in the world around us, seeing through the presence of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of every believer, what's actually happening around us. That's how Jesus lived. Uh, Jesus had all three types of people in his friend group, in his relationships, but he never let, listen to me, people keep him from the vision that God had for his life. Now, what's so interesting about that is people was part of the vision, but he didn't allow the relationships along the way to deter him from the cross. And Jesus is an incredible case study in how to navigate the complexities of relationships. Like, I love to preach about all the miracles that Jesus did. I love to talk about all the wonderful things that he taught. But one of the things that's fascinating is to look at how Jesus navigated the relationships of his life because he was a man that lived in relationship and community with others. Point number one this morning, and it's the last point that I had in my message last week, so we're going to pick back up. But this is the first point. Some people are wise, some people are foolish, and some people are evil. Some of y'all say, I knew it, I knew it. Some people are wise, some people are foolish, and some people are evil. All right, now I'm gonna go through these this morning because I think it's important to just not say it, but also say, what are some tendencies of evil people? What are some tendencies of foolish people? How do we navigate all these relationships? So this is where you wanna take notes. And I'm just telling you, if you're a business person in this place and you manage people in any way, shape or form, you need to take good notes this morning. Can I get a good amen in this house? All right, good amen in this house. All right, praise the Lord. Y'all can comment online too. All right, here we go. Tendencies of evil people. So how do we recognize maybe when we're dealing with something evil? Evil people are intentionally dangerous. Intentionally dangerous. Y'all ever met somebody like that? Like if there was trouble to be had, they're gonna find it. Ten intentionally dangerous. Listen, they have been hurt and they intentionally hurt people. They have been hurt and they intentionally hurt people. Now listen, one of the signs of foolish people is that they've been hurt and they unintentionally hurt people. So there's a difference between someone unintentionally hurting someone and someone hurting something, somebody intentionally, right? So one of the signs and tendencies of somebody that's dealing with evil is that they've been hurt and they intentionally hurt someone. Uh, they tend to be high control, high domineering, very low on empathy and compassion. So they're high control, high domineering. Listen, there's some spouses in here that are elbowing each other. Stop it. <laughs> very low on empathy and compassion. They live by law, not by love and grace. I, I, I saw a quote uh, by a pastor that I follow, and he made this statement. We become judges of other sin and great lawyers of our own. Mm, I know, somebody said that's good. Yeah, you're right, you can put my name associated to it. I'm just kidding, don't do that. If you want to, you can. Uh, we, <laughs> we become great judges of other sin and great lawyers of our own. Listen, there's something, there's something there, come on. They tend to be selfishly ambitious, have influence and present themselves as your friend or your confidant. Has anybody ever encountered somebody that was for some reason trying to get close to you? Now listen, this is really important when we deal with evil, especially when we kind of look at it and how it operates. Did you know that evil very rarely sits at the highest places of authority? Did you know that most of the time what takes place is it's not the person who you see, it's the people who you don't see? Do you understand? Uh, one, 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 one example of that in Scripture uh, would be Ahab. If you've ever read 1st, 2nd Kings, you see the evil king of Israel, Ahab, and his wife was Jezebel. And it was actually Jezebel who was moving Ahab, not necessarily all the time Ahab. Another way to look at it is, isn't it interesting that who was it that killed Jesus? It wasn't Judas. Judas didn't kill him. Judas betrayed him. All right. It was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the uh, religious sect of that day. 
What's interesting is even within the context of Scripture, we don't know many of those names. They were the ones manipulating the crowd when they asked for Barabbas to be freed and Jesus to be killed. Most of the time, evil hides in the shadows and it gets close trying to influence and overpower. We talked about this last week, that they live by demonic power, so they get their power from the demonic. Demonic is real. Some thoughts about when we encounter evil people. So what do we do? Because this is important. How, how, what do we do when we deal with this stuff? First one is this. We build walls and we get them professional help. In fact, I would even add to this. You don't just build a wall, you dig a moat. You put alligators in the moat and you get, just, just get in a safe place of protection. Now, why is this important? It's because God has given you stewardship over aspects of your life, right? So if you're a family, then you've got to steward your family. If you're a business owner, you've got to steward your business. If you're a church, you've got to steward your church. Listen to me. There are moments that we build walls so that we can love. Mm, some of y'all thinking really hard this morning. It doesn't mean that I don't love you anymore. It doesn't mean there's no hope for you. It just means that I'm not the hope for you. Uh, listen, people who are struggling with this, they need help. They just don't need your help. Come on, somebody. It's okay. You can't save everybody. That's Jesus' job. Some of us are trying to play the role of the Holy Spirit instead of let him do his thing. And when you look back in the early church, then they understood this principle that sometimes in moments when people would not shift, when people would not repent, that it was time to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to turn you over to the consequences of your decisions. That's some good stuff right there. Listen to this third one. We do not counsel the demonic, we cast it out. I got asked a question last week after last week's message. Uh, this week, I'm not gonna be out front, so don't come ask me. Um, I'm just kidding, I'll be out there. But, but a young lady came up to me and she said, you know, I just, I just feel like evil is all around. And this is what I told her, and, I, and, and depending on your background, I, this is just a true statement. The devil's not behind every bush, but he is behind some. There's some people that grow up in church and because of their religious background, they just think the devil does everything. The devil, devil don't do everything. Sometimes we do stuff, right? But then some people's background, they don't even know the devil exists. So the devil ain't behind every bush, but he is behind some. And recognizing that, listen, so often we get into conversations about things that actually don't produce life, because we're actually trying to counsel people through something that isn't something to counsel them through. It's a bondage in their life. All right. I can tell y'all excited about this. All right, we're going to keep going so we can get through it. All right. Tendencies of the foolish. Foolish people are many times the smartest person in the room. But they don't live in reality. They're allergic to it. They're many times the smartest people in the room, but they don't live in reality. Foolish people don't take responsibility. And in truth, they try to make their responsibility your responsibility. Have you ever had a friend like that? Like nothing was ever their fault. It's like a kid. Why is your room dirty? I don't know, daddy. Why is your shoes on the floor? I don't know, daddy. It's amazing they got there. Why is your bed not made up? Daddy, because you ain't made it up yet. What? What? Has any parent in this place ever felt like you work for your kids? <laughs> I'm like, what is going on? Why? Because when we're getting into that place, now listen, this is important about foolishness, right? And I just want to get you. Foolishness many times is an issue of immaturity, right? Said this the other week, and it didn't go over well, I'm going to say it again, because it's true, Right? It's absolutely awesome that my 13-year-old lives at home. How many of you know that that's acceptable, right? It ain't cool if he's still there at 30. You know what I'm saying? Like, I love him. And I just gave him probably nine years of grace right there. You know what I'm saying? 
<laughs> I'm like, freedom coming in Jesus' name. Come on. Some of y'all getting set free. Y'all going to go home and make plans right now. You're like, let's have a conversation, right? And if you are home, you better be paying rent and putting some food on the table. Come on, somebody in this house. Lord, don donuts are not free, guys. They're not free. Some of y'all catch that later. So here's the deal, man, is that many times what we're doing is we're trying to turn foolishness or bring foolishness into maturity. Foolish people are burden givers. They're not burden lifters. They are draining, not life giving. Uh, have you ever been around somebody and you literally felt like you lost years of your life by hanging out with them? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Like you're on a video game and you get around people and your life literally drains. Mm. Go home like, what's wrong with you? Well, I've been hanging out with so-and-so. <laughs> what do you want to do? <laughs> Nothing. I want to take a nap. <laughs> what I want to do, right? Is this too honest for you guys? Like this is, little, this is life. And we get around these things and we wonder why. Now listen, does it mean that we don't love foolish? No, we love foolish people. We love when we, we walk through them, we journey with them. So what are some things that we do or thoughts about when we encounter them? So with evil people, we build walls in a moat. With foolish people, we build boundaries and confront them with truth and love. I'm gonna build boundaries. I'm just gonna build a little boundary here. I'm gonna give us a little separation. That's all. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And why is confronting with truth and love so important? Because what was the diagnostic question that I talked about at the beginning. What does a person do when the what? Oh, you mean if we're going to be a church in the body of Christ, we're actually going to have to talk about the truth? Uh, you mean I don't just get to hear what I want to hear? You mean I just don't get to hear what I want to hear preached from the pulpit? No. You mean I got to hear the truth? Yeah. Why? Because we're trying to raise up disciples, not followers. This is, this is a big deal. So we confront them with truth in love. We build boundaries. Uh, they need not professional help, all right? All of us need professional help, come on. But they need a pastoral or parental relationship. I don't have that one on the screen. I added that one this week. Sorry, team. They need a pastoral or parental relationship. I just talked about it. Why? Because what we're trying to do is bring to maturity. Uh, foolish people are only motivated by consequences. I'm going to do a whole message because next week's message is on wisdom and how do we surround ourselves with wisdom. But I'm going, to, and I'm so excited about it, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you so that you can choose not to come if you don't want to, right? Because I'm going to talk about how the Lord disciplines us. It's an amazing thing how God disciplines us. And a lot of people, they don't understand, like when they hit tough places in their life, listen to me, consequences are real. Um, and God uses consequences because he loves us, not because he doesn't. Okay, it's his love for us trying to turn us from the direction that we're going that brings consequences about in our life. But what's so powerful about it is that not all consequences are the same and the way in which Hebrews speaks about it blows my mind because it talks about three different ways that God confronts us so that we turn towards him. And we're gonna talk about that tomorrow so it's gonna be awesome, not tomorrow, next week, whatever, all right? Thursday's right around the corner. I keep on forgetting, all right? Here's the uh, fourth one there. Foolish people need boundaries and assignments. Foolish people need boundaries and assignments. So we're going to give them assignments. We're not going to do the work for them. We're going to do, uh, give them assignments. My mom used to teach me this. She said, you know, when people come to you and they're needing help, Aaron, it's always great to help them. But a lot of times what they're actually wanting is for you to do all the work. And she used to say, the best thing to do for people is to give them an assignment to go do that will help them. And so, yes, what we do is we love people, but we want to love people appropriately. 
And there's many times in our loving of people, we actually hurt them more. That's some good stuff. Why? Because we actually never help bring them to the place where they understand that freedom can be theirs in Jesus. Uh, just, just real quick as we get to the evil and the, and the foolish, what's an example of someone who actually was evil? Well, Judas is an example of a foolish person, listen, who became evil. Peter is an example of a foolish person who turned wise. Both were foolish. One turned evil, one became wise. What's the difference? Is that Jesus confronted them both and gave them multiple opportunities. But one chose to turn evil, one chose to turn wise. And we're gonna talk about that in just a minute. All right, let's get to some wise, which we all are, right? Look at your neighbor and say, you're a wise person. You just lied in church. Anyway, so let's go on. I'm just kidding, kinda, kinda. Some of y'all lied, I don't know, we'll figure it out. Uh, tendencies of the wise. Wise people are humble and teachable. They're humble and teachable. They wanna learn. Uh, wise people ask questions. They listen to understand, they don't listen to respond. Mm, some people go, mm, mm, mm. doesn't mean I can't. What about Facebook? <laughs> you make up your own decision about that. Wise people ask questions. Listen, uh, some of the wisest people in my life ask the most questions. Um, and they're not asking questions to suck up to somebody. They're actually asking questions because they want to begin to understand. In, in our culture today, we are so uh, myopic in our understanding because we're only surrounded by people who are just like us for the most part, right? And so we actually never ask questions to understand. We ask questions so that we can make statements. Wise people ask questions to understand. Uh, they understand that the world is small. Uh, wise people embrace reality. They're not actually allergic to it. So, so here's the deal, and I need us to all recognize this. The faster we embrace reality, the faster that we can get on to solving the problem. The slower we are to embrace reality, it means the longer the problem will persist. Can I give us an example? Can I give us an example? Let me ask something. How many of you, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands on this, okay, because this, but, yeah. but it's a good example. If I went to pretty much every marriage that is going to listen to this message, then there are two or three things that you consistently argue about. Two or three things, okay? Can you just shake your head if I'm right, all right? Yeah, just two or three things. Now, let me ask something. Do you think after 15 years of marriage and you still argue about these two or three things that the next 15 years are going to change it? So it might be time to take the off-ramp and go do something different so that we can hopefully get some things fixed so we don't have to keep driving around the same place. Wise people say, I'm not the solution to my own problem. I need to go get some help. Listen, you see what I'm saying? Wise people aren't the smartest people in the room. They're just the quickest to ask for help. Come on, amen, Pastor. That's some good preaching right there. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to call this week and get some help. All right, good. Let's move on. Some thoughts about when we encounter wise people. We build community. So we're evil people, we build a wall. We're foolish people, we put up some boundaries. We're wise people, we say, come on in. Let's eat together. With wise people, we can have a personal relationship. A personal relationship. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need some help because I want to do something real quick. John is an example of a wise person, all right? And then we're going to be almost done with the message. But I want to give you some, um, uh, some equations, all right? So I'm going to ask Kiefer and I'm going to ask Cullen real quick to come up here real fast. Everybody welcome them to the stage, all right? They have no idea that I'm doing this, all right? Cool. So I want to give you this breakdown. I didn't do this thir uh, Thursday night, but I really wanted to because I think it's awesome, all right? I'm going to give you some equations because why? We, we have... Uh, these encounters all the time, all right? So good. All right, man, you look jacked today. All right, so here. 
because you're so big, I'm going to give you the wise person, all right? Foolish person, right there. Hold on to it. Look, hold it up. Smile for everybody. All right. When you mix a wise person plus a foolish person, you know what this is? A hot mess. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm going to put that in my notes. Thank you. That's funny. Hold on a second. Real quick. I'm serious. It's hard to type when people are listening and laughing. Hot mess. All right. Cool. No, this is a parental relationship. This is a parental relationship. I talked about it a little bit pastoral. So guess what? These two are not equally yoked. So this is going to be a parental relationship. All right. Sorry. You're going to be evil now. Let me see that. Thank you. All right. When you mix a wise person plus an evil person, you know what this is? This is a distanced relationship. Doesn't mean we don't have relationship, right? We don't get to seal ourselves off from the world. If you're surrounded by only evil people, you need to get new friends. Yeah. All right? But can I just be honest with you? If you're surrounded by evil people, you need to just look at yourself and say, maybe I'm evil. Because evil's not attracted to light. Mm, okay, cool. Just saying. All right? And more than likely, we don't deal with a ton of these people. All right, so don't go out of here saying, everybody I know is evil. You're evil. You're evil. Now, when you're on Greenville Boulevard, there's a lot of evil around. I'm just saying. <laughs> but but not, not typically. So most of us, we're wrestling with, so this is a distance relationship. All right? Y'all hold it together. You grab one part, you grab one part. Two foolish people. This ends up being an ECU frat party right there, Okay. <laughs> This, 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 this is a problem, all right? Because this is going to end up in regret and just foolish behavior, all right? Sounds good, all right? Let's see here. Evil person and a foolish person. Sorry, I'm having a hard time now. You're going to be evil this time. All right, foolish, all right? You know what this is? <laughs> Dumb and dumber. <laughs> I'm not going to write that one down. Um, this is an abusive relationship. When you see this taking place, this is an abusive. Why? Because this is high domineering, high control, and they're going to take advantage of someone there. Mm, got serious. All right. An evil person and an evil person. Y'all, y'all, y'all hold hands there. Not hold hands. This is an unholy alliance. This is a double barrel gun. Um, this many times takes place, and I could go through Scripture. I'm not going to because I'm beginning to run out of time. But I want you to see this right here. You go through Scripture, and you see it. You see it in the building of the wall of Nehemiah. You saw the alliance that was made by, 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 uh, in the men that would attack Nehemiah. You see this in Ahab and Jezebel. You see this all throughout Scripture, unholy alliance. And then you come back, and you see this. Wise people. Multiple wise people can build anything, and it's a holy alliance. Listen, you aren't wise because you're the smartest person in the room, but you are wise, and you're moving that direction when you surround yourself with wise people, and it is a beautiful thing. Can you give them applause for helping me out? Y'all go sit there. All right, let's go. Point number two this morning. The wise receive correction, the foolish ignore correction, and the evil run from correction. The wise receive correction, the foolish ignore correction, and the evil run from correction. Proverbs 9, 7 through 9 says, anyone who rebukes a mocker, which is foolish, will get an insult in return. Anyone who corrects the wicked will get hurt. So don't bother correcting mockers. They will only hate you. But correct the wise and they will love you. Instruct the wise and they will even be wiser. Teach the righteous and they will learn even more. And I want to go to that story in John chapter 21 because this to me, I could go to multiple places and how Jesus dealt with his disciples. But this to me is probably one of the most beautiful moments in all of scripture. I want you to kind of use your imagination today with me. Uh, your name is Peter. Peter. You have, you are a fisherman, and a lot of the culture's way of viewing you 
you had a very minimal job. And one day, Jesus, this man, came walking along the side of the road and saw you. And he called you to come follow after him. At the moment, you didn't know why you were saying yes and leaving everything you had. But you left everything you had and you started following this man named Jesus. What you would see in the next three and a half years would absolutely blow your mind. He invited you into relationship with him. In fact, it seemed as if you had maybe one of the closest relationships with him along with James and John because Jesus would invite you three to go places with him that he wouldn't even invite the other nine. You had experienced him on the Mount of Transfiguration. You had been with him in some of the most crazy moments of his life. It seemed like you were maybe even his best friend. Yet Jesus at times would say some pretty harsh things to you. Like get behind me, Satan. Had to step over a little bit of a fence with Jesus over that. Also, at one point, Jesus even said that I would deny him three times. And sure enough, three times is what I denied him. And then one day, after his death, his burial, and his resurre- resurrection, Jesus comes where Peter and the boys are, and he shows them all his resurrected body. And after they had ate together, because Jesus was hungry, he pulled Peter to the side, and he has this conversation. Some have taught it like Jesus was restoring Peter. In my personal opinion, Jesus was not restoring. He was actually confronting. He was saying to Peter, listen, Peter, I've got great plans for your life. I've got things ahead of you that you cannot even imagine. But Peter, for you to go with me and to accomplish all of that, something in this relationship actually has to change. And this is the context of John chapter 21. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Look at your neighbor and say love. All right, now listen, I need you to catch this, all right? In our American language, there's one word for love, right? So we love donuts and we love Jesus. Some of us love Jesus and we love donuts, all right? Do you understand that we put, when we say love, it bears really no different context. In Greek, there's four different words for love. All of them meaning different things. Jesus asked Peter here in this moment, do you agape me, which is God love, which is love to the highest and best. Even if it costs me, I'm still going to love. This is not mutually beneficial love. This is love to the extent that I want what's best for you, regardless of how it impacts me. That's the love that Jesus has for each and every one of us. Jesus loves you enough. Listen, that he gave his only son. Do you think that hurt the heart of God to give? No, no, no. Do you understand? Like, this is stuff that we get lost in. We're like, oh, but God knew that he was going to resurrect him. Stop it. Stop being weird. Stop reading everything like you've already read the end of the book. No, God, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And so come in his place, they, he says, Peter, do you love me? And listen to Peter's response. More than these, yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know that I love you, phileo. Peter was admitting in this moment that Jesus, I don't love you like you love me. Now listen, up to this point, Peter had tried to act like he had it all together. Oh, Peter, you're gonna deny me three times. God, I'm never gonna deny you. I'll die for you if I have to. But here on the seashore, Peter says, you know what, God, I I fillet you. I I have a brotherly affection for you. 
but it's different than what you do for me. And he goes on to say, then take care of my sheep. A third time or a second time, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Do you agape me? Same thing. Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know that I phileo you. Then take care of my sheep. Listen, a third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you fillet? Oh, Jesus just changed the word. Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked the question a third time. And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. You know that I fillet you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Listen to this. He says, I tell you the truth. When you were young, You were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this by letting him know what kind of death that he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. In this moment, Peter is getting confronted. It's a test. Jesus tested to promote. He never promoted to test. And Jesus looks at Peter. And up till this point, Peter had thought, because he had grown up in religion, that it was his perfection that dictated his usefulness to Jesus. And here, Jesus switches it and says, Peter, it's not your perfection, son. It's your honesty. Will you be honest about where you're at? And in that moment, Peter recognizes that it's not about his love reaching Jesus. It's about how great Jesus' love is for Peter. Until we recognize that there is a big difference in understanding that it is not our perfection that makes us usable, but it is our honesty. It is this place in us that continues to try to hide, that continues to try to say, God, we've got it all together. Can I just assure you this morning that none of us, including the guy preaching this message, has it all together. And at some point, we're going to have to realize that our usefulness to God is not based in our perfection, but it is actually based in our honesty. That will we get honest before God and honest with ourselves that says, God, I don't know, but there's things in me that God, I know aren't right. I know that God, I'm not perfect. I know that God... I don't love you like you love me. Jesus loved him enough to look him in the eye and tell him the truth. Who have you given permission to? To look you in the eye tell you the truth it bothers me today because we live in a culture that really is allergic to truth we're so easily offended by anybody who confronts us that so often we defend when we should receive we get angry and write off when we should do what my daddy used to teach me chew up the meat and spit out the bones boy See, the last two years, they've done more to our psyche than what we realize. You know what I'm saying? Because it's really made us self-protect. Getting this place that we realize, man, wise people, they don't just receive correction, they go looking for it. I remember, you know, I told a story about my daddy last week. And I'm going to tell another one because my daddy was, he, he was a daddy. And I went through a place in my life where my dad, he corrected me and he corrected me and he corrected me. And I was, you know, he was, he was trying to get the foolish out of his boy. And I'm telling you, it was a, it was a long battle. I tell you, it was a hard battle. My sister, not so much. She, she came out speaking in tongues, evidently. I don't know. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but I didn't, you know. And, um, 
And so my daddy, he just, he was always that voice in my life. And then I grew up and his voice became silent. And I remember like going through this moment of just kind of praying because it kind of, it threw me off. Like it, it threw me off because I knew I wasn't perfect, you know? And I was praying one, one, one morning and I just recognized that when I was young, my dad used to come and grab me and pull me into the light. But now that I was older, I was getting invited to step into the light. And those are two different things. My dad's voice became more silent until I asked. And then it was as loud as ever. It just required me seeking it out instead of trying to hide from it. Point number three, how a person responds to confrontation and correction reveals what type of person they are. How a person responds to confrontation and correction reveal what type of person that they are. Until confronted, you many times don't even know what you got. And isn't it interesting that we live in a culture that has fewer face-to-face -face conversations than ever in our history? Like, when was the last time that we really sat down and looked somebody in the face and had a real conversation? No, we like to throw grenades on social media. That doesn't change anything. What changes something is that Jesus loved Peter enough to go to the seashore have a face-to-face -face conversation and tell them the truth. Who do you have in your life that you love enough to look them in the eye and tell them the truth? Who do you have in your life who loves you enough to look you in the eye and tell you the truth? In 1995, I was at a youth camp and this passage of scripture was something that was shared and it forever changed my life. This is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We aren't practicing the truth, but if we are living in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus covers us from all sin. You know, one of my, my, my desires as your pastor is that you would recognize, and this is for all of our church, all those who listen, is that the love of God is only theory until God sees you on your worst day. The love of God is only theory in our mind until we step in the light and we say, God, here I am and all that I am and you see me and you love me you accept me and you call me son, you call me daughter, you call me friend. God, you mean it's not my perfection, but you just want my honesty? See, in all of our religious garb, many times we never come to the place that we allow people to actually experience the true authentic love of God. The true authentic love of God. Not the emotion, not the goosebumps, not the stuff that says, woo, praise the Lord. But the stuff that begins to fall on me like liquid love. It says, God, here we are, a fallen people, a sinful people that are in need of your love, your touch in our lives. Today, as we get ready to close the service, we're gonna close in a very different manner. The guy who spoke about that passage of scripture to me in the early 90s, he wrote a song. And my sister is getting ready to come and sing it. And instead of us having some big emotional moment, I want us to take communion and I want us to sit right there in your seat. The altars are gonna be open old school this morning. No, no, nobody's gonna be down here to pray. If you feel like you need to come and bow down at the altar, come to the altar, that's great. All right, some of the Baptists in the room, y'all feel real comfortable with that. But I encourage you, let's encounter God this morning because he is here. 
in a real way. And if you're watching online, we've got people that are ready to pray with you this whole entire service. We love to pray with you. So take that communion, peel back all those layers. On the night before its death, John chapter 13 talks about the greatest meal that was ever provided. It was in that moment that Jesus would bring light into the room. He would go on within the next 24 hours and he would die. But before he died, he broke open communion and he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it and he said, this is my body that is broken for you. In that room that night would be Judas, there would be Peter, there'd be John, there'd be all these other disciples. And Jesus in that night was saying, listen, you've got choices to make, but I'm breaking my body so that you can be whole. Today, know that Jesus' body was broken so that you could be holding your spirit, your soul, and your body. Take and eat. And then the blood of Jesus grace of God poured out in our life. You know, without God's grace, we can't forgive, which we're going to talk about that in this series. We can't let go. But with it, we have the ability to say, God, we forgive those who have stabbed us in the back, those who have hurt us along the way. God, your grace in my life causes me to operate in grace with others. So today, don't lose the wonder of the blood because it's supernatural. It's powerful. It's palatable. It's his love in our life. Take and drink. All right. They're going to dim the lights. And I just pray wherever you're at, Holy Spirit, shine your light in our life. Lord, that we would be a people that step into the glory and recognize how much our God loves us. We give you glory. We give you praise in Jesus' name.